Hi, my name is Vlad Genshu, and I am a civil jury trial attorney in the state of California. I try civil jury trials, personal injury jury trials in Los Angeles County. I have also tried one outside of LA County in Orange County. I want to talk to you today about the art of cross-examination. There is a book exactly with that title, The Art of Cross-Examination. It was published, I believe, sometime early in the 20th century. And the concept is cross-examination, the point of cross-examination is to get the truth, okay? But like the rest of trial, and we'll talk about this in a more general theme, you need preparation, preparation, preparation. Johnny Cochran in his book, A Lawyer's Life, said, the key to trial is preparation, 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 preparation. And luck, if you will, is the intersection of hard work, timing, and preparation. So when we talk about cross-examination, we want to talk about what you want to get. So there's cross-examination of uh, lay witnesses, if you will, the in a car accident case, the person who re-rented your client. There's cross-examination of expert witnesses, the defense medical examiner, maybe a defense accident reconstructionist, a defense retained, biomechanical expert, a defense retained, biller. So let's talk first about cross-examining lay witnesses. In this case, we'll talk about the person in a car accident case who rear-rented your client. So when we're talking about cross-examination of somebody who is not an expert, you're dealing with somebody who is, quote-unquote, a regular person, you know, a working person, uh, just your salt-of-the-earth human being. Um, when you cross-examine the person who rear-rented your client, you have the opportunity in California to use Code of Civil Procedure Section 776, which is basically after you have finished, after opening statement has finished, the plaintiff opening and the defense opening, you can take out of order in the witnesses. And instead of putting on your witnesses first, you can cross-examine the defense expert, excuse me, the defense, um, the, the defendant who you are suing which in this case would be the person who re-rented uh, your client. The reason you might want to do that is the, in a civil case, the defendant, the defense lawyer does not actually have to call their client. They don't have to do that. So in their case in chief, after you've rested, they don't have to call the defendant. They probably will, but they don't have to. And actually the defendant doesn't even have to be there. So in a civil case. So in order to be able to 776, you're going to have to use Code of Civil Procedure 1987, where you basically, it's a it's a notice to appear at trial in lieu of a subpoena. You don't have to subpoena the actual defendant because you've already sued and served them, but you can, uh, you can 1987 them in, forcing them to show up at trial. Uh, and at that point, you can, once they're there, and, you've, and the opening statements are done by both sides, you can 776 that, meaning using Code of Civil Procedure 776. So these are all California state court uh, trials that I'm, we're talking about here. So the California Code of Civil Procedure applies. So let's say you've 776, the way it would work is the defense opening statement is finished after your opening statement and the, and the court would say, the judge would say, plaintiff call your first witness. and you, the plaintiff's attorney, would say, Your Honor, the plaintiff calls by 776, the defendant, Miss Smith, Mr. Jones, Miss Alvarez, Mr. Lee, whatever. And that person would then, the judge might explain to the jury, ladies and gentlemen, the jury uh, in California, we have a specific code section which allows the plaintiff to take out of order the defense, uh, the defendant in this case, and cross examine them by, seven, seven, by California Code of Civil Procedure 776. So now the defendant is who re rented your client's going to go up on the stand. He or she's going to raise their hand. They're going to swear to tell the truth, just like they would in any other case. And what's going to happen is you're going to begin your 776. So remember, everything about a trial has to be prepared, it has to be scripted. You're not up there to ask questions to look like a lawyer, you're up there to get a point across. So, how are you going to get a point across? The key is preparation. So you should have deposed this person who rear-ended your client or caused this car accident or you think caused this car accident if it's not a rear-render. 
So you should already know in many ways what this person is going to say because you took their deposition a year ago or a year and a half ago or six months ago. So what you're going to need, what you're going to need is to make sure that your cross-examination comes from that deposition. If you don't have a deposition, then you're kind of, it's kind of like a wild, wild west gunslinging show because you don't really know what answer you're going to get, right? Um, the, the trick about cross-examination is it's kind of the inverse of direct examination. The lawyer is the star in cross-examination and the person who's being cross-examined wants to say as little as possible, right? Because it is, you are leading the defendant. You are leading the other person because they are an adverse witness, right? So you're allowed to say, isn't it true? Or haven't you done this? Or true, true, you know, you're, you're allowed to lead the person. But the best way is through preparation and the best way is to go through the deposition. So the way I would start a 776 of a defendant is by going through something as simple as the admonitions, which is the ground rules of the deposition. In the deposition, you had admonitions. So you want to tell the jury to hint to them and actually to put red flags that this isn't the first time this person has been asked questions about this car accident. And you want to do that for a number of reasons so that you make it clear that this person actually knew what was going on before. They had an opportunity to previously state something about it under oath in your office or more likely through Zoom. So let's talk about the admonitions. Why would you do that? So here's how you would do it. Let's talk about why you would do it. You would do that so that you make it clear to the jury that this person had been deposed before. You might want to, before you start um, talking about the deposition, have the judge read the the Casey, the California Civil Jury Instruction on what a deposition is, that it is just as good uh, testimony as in court because it's under oath so that the jury understands what the deposition is. Most jurors will not have ever been deposed. They might not know what a deposition is. So you want to explain to them, hey, this is just like being on the stand except it was through Zoom or in, in, in some kind of deposition office. It's sworn testimony. What you want to do when you start your 776 is explained to the jury by asking the following questions of the person you are cross-examining by 776, the following. Do you remember, Ms. Jackson, that about six months ago, through Zoom, you had your deposition taken? Well, I don't, I don't remember, I don't remember. And that's where you begin the cross-examination. You say, Your Honor, I have the deposition of the defendant, Miss, you know, Miss Jackson, taken on March 15th of 2023 uh, through a video conference. I just like to show to the court the f basically the first page says video conference. So counsel, please you know, tell me which page you're talking about. Say, page one, lines one through three says video conference deposition. You say, okay, that's, it was a video conference deposition. Move on, counsel. You've already told the jury, this is a video conference deposition. You say, Ms. Jackson, do you remember that when we started the deposition, the attorney who took your deposition said he's going to give you the ground rules and that you're under oath. Oh, I don't remember. I don't remember. You say, Your Honor, permission to read page one, lines one through six of the deposition. And you wait for defense counsel to see if they have any objections. They can't. And then you just read, good morning, Ms. Jackson. My name is Vlad Genshu, John Smith, whoever. And today I'm going to be taking your deposition. And you just read the lines you said you were going to read where it explains, this is a deposition. Here's what a deposition is. You're beginning to undermine the credibility of the person. If they begin to squirm, if they begin to try to not answer the question truthfully, if they say they can't recall, if they try to hedge, right? And try to have it both ways, talk both ways out of their mouth. And then you go, okay. And you remember where we said that everything you say at the deposition is under oath? Yes. And you remember where I said that the same thing, it carries the same force and effect. It's just as good what you're saying at the deposition as if you'd be coming to trial. Yes. And you remember you took that oath, you raised your right hand. Yes. And you actually were, you weren't in my office at that deposition, were you? You were actually at home uh, through a video conference through Zoom, right? Yes. And your lawyer was actually present, maybe not next to you, but they were also on the video conference, um, you know, basically Zoom call, if you will, right? Yes. And your deposition had the ability and actually did make some objections at the deposition, right? Well, I don't remember. But your depo your lawyer was there, correct? Yes. And then remember I told you that you had the opportunity if you needed to, to take any breaks during the deposition, Yes. And if you remember this deposition, I told you it wasn't going to be long. It didn't last, lasted about 
75 minutes, right? I don't know, counsel. Well, Your Honor, I just ask that we uh, take judicial notice and take a look at the first page where it says the deposition started at 3.05, Your Honor. And at the end, if we go, it ended at 4.25, Your Honor. If we could just read that for the jury. Sure. So, Your Honor, can we take judicial notice that the deposition lasted six, 73 minutes, Your Honor? Yes. So, Ms. Jackson, does that sound about right? It didn't last. For, it lasted 75, 73 minutes, something like that? Sure. And I told you that if you had any questions, if you didn't understand any of the questions that I asked you at the time of the deposition, please feel free to make to tell me you don't understand what I'm saying. You don't understand what you're what I'm, what I'm getting at, right? I, I don't remember. You're on a permission to read page and then you go through it. Page three of the deposition lines 11 through six and you read it. Ms. Jackson, if you know, I wanted to tell you, if you don't understand any of my questions, uh, just tell me to rephrase it. And Ms. Jackson, before we started the deposition, I also told you that do not guess and do not guess to any single uh, question. Remember? I don't remember. Read it again. Tell her that you can make estimates, but you can't take guesses. And Ms. Jackson, I told you that any answer you give is explained. It is understood that you would understand my question. You, you remember I said that? I don't remember. Read it where you said that. What you're doing is you're basically telling the jury, this person has been deposed before. They've been through this before. You've talked about the car accident before. So now you're setting it up that this isn't new, right? So if they change their testimony right now on the stand, yeah, they're going to have a credibility problem. The next thing you want to do, the last thing before you start the, the real question, you say, and Ms. Jackson or whoever, you know, Mr. Smith, Ms. Jones, Ms. Alvarez, you remember that I told you if you had any changes that you wanted to make at all, you had the opportunity to make changes to your deposition after you got the booklet. You and your lawyer could sit down and you could make changes. I remember I told you that? I don't remember. Read it again. Page six of the deposition, lines three to nine. And then finally you say, and you didn't make any changes to your deposition transcript. I don't remember. And then show the errata sheet, the, 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 which is where the mistakes are, and say that nothing was made. So, so Miss Smith or whoever is Miss Smith, you're, you had a valid California driver's license on insert date, correct? Of this car crash, February 6, 2020, right? Yes. And isn't it true that you had, had, you had to take a test, a written test to get that driver's license? Yes. And part of that test was you learned basic California vehicle code law, right? Yes. You, you had to learn how is it, how does one operate a car in the state of California, correct? Yes. And you knew that when you're operating a car, at the end of the day, you could, if you're not paying attention, get into a car accident, right? I guess. And you remember when you took this test that it's important to make sure that you're driving at a safe speed in California, right? And you might get objections here and there. But the, the point that you're trying to make is this person took a test, the driver's license test, whenever it was, 17, 18, driver's um, ed, whenever, the license is valid, right? And this person, for whatever reason, rear-rented your client, right? Or, or didn't uh, yield uh, to, a, to a left turn. And you want to do that in part by the questions, a lot of it's common sense. But if you don't feel comfortable enough doing it through common sense, then what you should do is Take the deposition transcript, summarize the deposition, prepare your questions, prepare your questions, prepare your questions, right? And the thing you got to remember is this person has obviously been prepared by their attorney before the cross-examination, right? So you're probably only going to get yes, no answers. You're going to get a little bit of hedging here and there. So what do you want to get? You want to get concessions, okay? This person was deposed before. Okay, she's whatever they said in the deposition that is gold you want to bring out, right? So if they were saying something like, you know, uh, I was driving 65 miles per hour and then I break, I broke, you know, two seconds before the impact and I think that I re-rented this person at 45, 
and then you ask them, you ask them on the stand, isn't it true, uh, Mr. Smith, that you rear-ended this, my client? I'd like not to say my client. I'd say, isn't it true, Mr. Smith, that you rear-ended Joe and Jill and Jack uh, Smith, or Jones, whatever the names are, at 45 miles per hour? No, no, I, I don't remember that. Your, uh, Your Honor, ask to permission to read. You get you get them on it, right? If you got them on it in deposition, you get them on on the stand again, right? And then you talk about um, other things. For example, they might say, well, the plaintiffs at the scene didn't tell me they were in pain. You can say, well, Mr. Smith, isn't it true that uh, you're not a medical doctor, correct? Yeah, you're not a nurse. You're not a doctor of osteopathic medicine. You're not a chiropractor. You're not a physical therapist. You're not an EMT. You're none of these things, right? You're not yeah, a medical provider, correct? You want to get him on that or her on that. You want to cross-examine based upon the deposition and get stuff that helps your case. A 776 sometimes might not be longer than 20 to 25 minutes where you're getting the concessions. A rear end collision happened. They weren't paying attention. If they say your client wasn't hurt at the scene, uh, tell you know basically get out that they're that they're not an expert in this. They wouldn't know. Uh, get out what you need that is good in the deposition transcript. And if they try to hedge, just use the deposition transcript. If you have photos of the car wreck, if you say, Mr. Mr. Jackson, you call this a major impact to the uh, plaintiff's vehicle, correct? No, I, I don't remember that. And then read in the deposition. And if he doesn't say in the deposition, if he called it a moderate impact, you know what you do? You take, you say, Your Honor, uh, I'd like to, I'd like to publish, I'd like to mark for identification, plaintiff's exhibit one, a eight by twelve document which depicts the uh, rear and the back of the plaintiff's vehicle, the rear bumper. I would like to publish it. A copy has already been showed to defense counsel. Mark it a plaintiff's exhibit one. And there's since any objection. This is already in your trial document, so there shouldn't have been any objection. And then you publish it. Put it on the Elmo. And then you show it. And you say, Mr. Jackson, this is a photo uh, of the defend of the plaintiff's vehicle, whatever, the Chevy Impala, on March 9th, 2023, when this car accident occurred, correct? Well, blah, 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 blah. Do, do you see how? Do you remember that the vehicle that you were in was a Chevy Impala? Well, I, I don't. I don't remember. If he says in the depot, boom, you got him there. Read it in the depot transcript. If he said in the depot that it was a Chevy, get him just that it's a Chevy. Do you remember what kind of car you were driving? Oh well, yeah, of course, I was driving a Honda Accord. Your Honor, permission to identify. Permission. You, you got to be fluid with this, right? Because. They're, they don't they don't want to lose their trial of the defense. So let's just say that they're saying, oh, I, I don't know. I, I don't know where that, that thing's taken. It's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous position to take. But you right now, you don't get that with the jury, right? The jury just says, oh, I don't, all I heard was, no, that's not it. So only, remember, the evidence is only what the jury hears on the stand from the witnesses, in this case, the defendant, and what they see. So they just saw a photo and he hasn't identified it yet. So what do you do? Okay, fine. You want to play that game? Here's what we're going to do. Show him Plaintiff's Exhibit 2. Your Honor, I have a Plaintiff's Exhibit 2. It is a photograph of a Honda Accord with front bumper property damage on and, a, you know, which was done on whatever, March 6, 2023. Copier has already been shown to Defense Counsel permission to publish. Uh, court will say, any objections to Defense Counsel? No. Pulp, take Plaintiff 1 off, put Plaintiff 2 on the El Elmo. Mr. Jacks, Mr. Smith. Do you, do you see what's shown in this photograph? Uh, uh, yes. You see it, how it's... Is that your car on March 6, 2023? It could be. That'd be a horrible thing for him to say. He'd probably say, yeah, it, it is my car. So this is the car, and, and this is the property... You see property damage there? Yeah. You, you see how the property damage is in the front bumper? Yeah. And that property damage, that's from the actual impact that a, of the car accident impact of March 6, 2023, right? And you want to call it car crash, but that's from the car crash, right? You were driving that car on March 6, 2023, right? And because you were driving that car and you rear-ended the car in front of you, that's the property damage that occurred, right? Yeah. And there had been no other property damage of this type to your car before that day, March 6, 2023, correct? Yeah. You didn't have any other rear, uh, excuse me, you didn't have any other uh, front bumper 
uh, property damage, correct? Yeah. Okay, good. So let's talk about the car in front, M Mr. Jackson. I'm going to put P1 back. Your car, remember the Honda Accord, the, the one it had property damage, right? To the front bumper, right? Yeah. All smashed in, right? The hood too, right? That's the car that we rented the car in front of it, right? Well, I, I guess. Okay. So are you comfortable now saying that P1, this photograph that I have here, actually is a photo of the Chevy Impala that your Honda Accord re-rented. Yes. And that property damage that's seen on the Chevy Impala, the uh, the car in front of your car, that is from this car accident, correct? Yeah. And and you caused that, your rear end hit caused that property damage, correct? Yeah. Let's just say for whatever reason, he says he still doesn't know what's on P1. Take get, If you get a photo, P3, which shows both of the cars from a distance, you show him that. And you know what happens? If he actually, he or she are playing these games, is playing these games, it's a really bad look. In reality, what's going to happen is the defense counsel is going to say, look, get up there. They're going to, you know, prep them and say, get up there and, and say, yeah, you caused the thing. It's your fault. I'm really sorry. They weren't complaining of any injuries at, at the scene. Um, and then they're going to start saying what helps or hurts objectively with your case. You know, was an ambulance called? If an ambulance was called, he, he'll claim if, if he called the ambulance, he'll say, I cared so much about your clients. I called the ambulance. If law enforcement was called and he called, he'll say, I was so concerned. I called law enforcement. Right. And if there was no law enforcement, he'll say, well, I know, no law enforcement was called trying to make it look like it's not that big of a deal. Uh, tow trucks, all that kind of stuff. Make sure you cross examine on whether. Uh, his car was able to be towed from the scene or not, if his car was uh, drivable, uh, if, it, if he, uh, you know, again, law enforcement came and all that kind of stuff. You're probably not going to have him up there for more than 20 to 25 minutes. Show the photos. Try to see if he's going to be straight with the jury and tell the truth about how it happened or not. That's basically what you're going to get. Um, we'll make another video about if you have a law enforcement officer uh, as a witness come. Uh, then there's issues with whether they actually can testify to whether a vehicle code was broken, uh, violated, or uh, what, if they have the roller tape. That's the only way they can really talk about, uh, you know, speeds and all that kind of stuff, how fast people were going, because they weren't really at the scene when it happened. So that's your 776 cross-examination of the person who you, who you are suing, the defendant in the car accident case. Let's talk about experts. Um, before we get into the specifics, whether it's a medical doctor, a chiropractor, a doctor of osteopathic medicine, the medical, or, or axe recon, or accident reconstructionist, or a biomechanical, or a medical builder, understand this. No matter how good of a lawyer you are, no matter how intelligent you are, how hardworking you are, chances are you never will know the expert's field as well as the expert, right? Unless you also are a medical doctor and a lawyer, you probably are not going to know medicine as well as the medical doctor, period, full stop. Um, so you need to consider that and remember that, which means even more so than with the lay witness who you know, you're suing, you need to stick to the deposition and you need not to go into the rabbit hole of arguing medicine, arguing billing, arguing physics with an accident reconstructionist who often might be an engineer in arguing biomechanics with somebody who might be an engineer. If somebody has a PhD in a certain field, it is, it, it, there must be humility on the attorney's part who's, taking, who's doing the cross-examination of knowing that even if you've read 20 depositions of this person, even if you've read a couple articles, even 10 articles about this field, you're not gonna know, you're not gonna know it, right? You're not gonna know the field. You're not gonna know accident reconstruction. You're not gonna know orthopedic surgery. Of course not, right? Don't confuse a Google search with a medical degree, with passing somebody's boards or passing, becoming, you know, going through residency or all that kind of stuff. Same story with a PhD, writing a dissertation. You can't compare. As an attorney, nobody, the medical doctor wouldn't want to practice, wouldn't want to pretend they're practicing law. The acts recon would not want to pre pretend they're practicing law, so on and so forth. So what you want to do with the expert is you're going to cross-examine on two fields, two areas. Number one is bias, which is far easier to do. And number two is the substance of what they're saying. Both are going to be heavily based on past research and both are gonna be based on what they said in their deposition. But past research, if you have the, the ability to do it, if you have the resources, if you have the time, is gonna be critical. So regarding most experts, I wanna talk about medical experts first. Most defense ret retained 
experts on the medical field, medical doctors, have a long history of working for defense entities, insurance companies, uh, and the law firms that uh, they retain to defend their policyholders, their insurance. So if you're dealing with a medical doctor, you need who is who performed the quote unquote independent medical examination more and you, you need to get make sure you file a motion and eliminate to not allow that thing to be called an independent medical examination it is either going to be called a defense doctor examination a defense medical examination or it's just going to be called by its term in the code of civil procedure which is a physical examination but you're not going to let it be called an ime an independent medical exam because it's not independent right so at the end of the day you need to get some things across with that uh, medical doctor and bias is one of them. So if you have prior court transcripts, the certified copy, if you have prior deposition transcripts, the certified copy, make sure that you, if you can find it in there where they say that they are actually uh, retained 80% by defense attorneys uh, to go and, uh, you know, when they go to trial, they go, they're retained 80% by the defense. So when they go give testimony, 80% by the defense. If they say 50-50, in your case, in your, in your deposition, then, you know, you, then either I would not correct them at the deposition. If you have a, a court transcript, you wait for it. You have the certified transcript, wait for it and use it, uh, at the trial, at the trial. If, if you know how to use it for cross-examination, you got to make sure in terms of using that, you got to make sure you have the first page is, is the superior court of the state of California. Here's when the trial occurred. Second page is who was sworn to testify that day. Third page is it, through whatever or your actual material you're using, cross-examination. And the final is the signature signature page by the court reporter. That's what, and it has to say certified transcript. Same story with the deposition. You could actually bring the entire deposition. If it's a long one, you can just bring the pages. Again, first page, if you will, the, the first page of the deposition where it says, you know, Superior Court, City of California, case number, certified copy, certified transcript, and then who the attorney appearance is, and then the, the substantive material, and then actually uh, signed by the court reporter. That's the way you th that stuff is brought in uh, in front of a court. So what you want to bring in is, yeah, they're not 50-50, they're 80-20 for the defense, or 95-5 for the defense, more likely. Um, then you want to bring in the fact that this doctor who is giving uh doing a physical examination not only were they paid by the defense but any diagnoses that they have are not going to be treated by that doctor they're not going to be treated by the defense doctor they're just doing it for litigation purposes you also want to make sure that you get out that that doctor is not uh does not have any patient uh, doctor patient uh relationship so they're not there to treat they're just there to evaluate and they'll say they're only going to give their neutral opinion uh, and then you can get in how much money has been paid to that doctor on this case it's usually about minimum ten thousand dollars plus you get in how much their hourly deposition rate is get in how much their half day trial trial rate is how much their uh, full uh, day trial rate get in in your deposition you should ask any money question how much money they make in med legal a year uh, what percent of it is defense and versus plaintiff? You get all that in, and then that's your bias uh, at trial. The substantive part is the medicine. You need to learn that uh, somewhat uh, in um, more detail. We're not going to do a, a video on that, right? This is not going to be the video about substantive medicine. It's not enough time. Same story that you're going to do with the biller and with the um, axe recon and the biomechanical expert. You want not to argue with them. You don't want to argue period with an expert, but you don't want to go down the rabbit hole of trying to contradict them on something that they know really hard. Because the thing is, is the jury is always, you, generally speaking, they're going to believe an expert. Many times your expert will cancel out their expert. So you want to focus on the bias. And if you, if you know the medicine, your doctor can assist you, your retained expert can assist you with why the defense retained expert or the other size retained expert is wrong. So before you get up there and argue the substance, which you as an attorney probably don't know that well, make sure you talk to your expert, make sure you do your own research uh, so that you can go in there. And remember, when it comes to cross-examination, you're gonna ask yes or no questions. And this is the most important part of this entire video. Generally speaking, on cross-examination, 
if you are a beginning to intermediate cross-examiner. Do not ask any question that you do not know the answer to. Every question that you ask, you should know the answer to. And that is why you're able to impeach because the answer is in a deposition transcript. And it's usually either an answer that does not favor the person uh, that you are impeaching and you know the answer and it helps you and you got it in your back pocket in a deposition transcript or some court transcript. So don't ask any question that you don't understand, that you don't, do not ask any question that you don't know the answer to in, uh, in, in, in cross-examination. When you're gonna impeach, you gotta be ready to do it. Every question you ask, you have to know the answer and you have to have, if you will, the backup in your pocket, the deposition or a prior court transcript where you were able to say, no, here's what you said back then. Here's the real truth. Don't ask any question you don't know the answer to. Thank you very much.